Alright, the book is called True Colours. Um, it was done with Niall Kelly. Were you happy how it finished up? Yeah, well, the, the finish wasn't written until the finish was in Cheltenham. So it, uh, I was happy how Cheltenham finished up. So now I'm, I'm happy how it has finished up. I'm, I'm happier in retirement than I thought I'd be. I thought I'd be more of a tortured soul than I am. I thought it was a fantastic listen. As I, when I say listen, I listen to books rather than read them. And um, from someone who's in racing all my life as well, but there was so much stuff that I never knew before. And I thought it was very, very intriguing. A lot of the stories that you tell about injuries, the good days, and just some of the small things, I suppose. Uh, 1,920 winners between Ireland and England. He started off with your first winner in 97. An incredible career he had. Yeah, no, I, I had a great time. And loved it, really loved it. Um, but yeah, lots of highs, lots of lows. Um, but yeah, it was twenty four years. But it was it was it was a great way to to spend your youth and and to, to make your living at something doing what you love. And um, without giving away too much, um, so people can read the book. Noel Mead, um, that's where it all really started for you. Um, behind Paul Carberry, you had some great days with Noel, and Noel was very good to you. And um, before you moved on to some big things, then. Yeah, um, I started with Noel in September 96, I just turned 17. I'd ridden a good few winners pony racing the previous couple of years and Noel had heard good reports and he was wondering would I be interested in coming down and, you know, he, he was, he said that, you know, if you put in the work that the opportunities are there. At the time, Paul had, had gone to England to ride for Sir Robert Ogden, so there was an opportunity there um, and Noel was good to his word. And I had some, some a great time there. Paul came back after a couple of years, and I rode a second jockey to Paul, which was a good role in itself. Um, so no, I I had a great time with Noel. A great place to learn. He would give you great confidence and belief in his instructions, um, and he would trust you to, to make the right decision. So he was, I would have got a lot of confidence and learned a lot from Noel. What I thought was very inter interesting was that you were trying to ride like Paul and you're two completely different riders. And what Terry Mitchell said to you um, was a huge turning point in your career then. Yeah, so I, I adjusted my style, if you like, um, copying Paul's nearly. Um, Noel was keen for me to, 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 to maybe tidy up to that way of riding. And it, it doesn't, your, your, your central balance point is where it comes from. It's a bit like skiing. That's what that's your point of balance. You know where you're comfortable, and it's the same on a horse. So it's it's different for everyone, and you make a different shape when you're on a horse. You sit differently. You ride maybe shorter, or you ride longer, whichever works. So um, I was changed my style, and I wasn't. Um, it, it happened at the same time I'd been out for three months with a vertebrae, broken vertebrae. So I'd come back after that, and I was taking. I was trying to ride in a different way. And I'd spent a year and teams had really gone bad over fences. I was falling off. I was I was get I couldn't get around over fences nearly. And I fell off Mary Gale at the second and Mace when he was short and price favourite. Um but Terry Mitchell, who would have been a senior writer at the time, he just grabbed me and he, one day and he says, John, I've been watching you over fences and you're not taking much contact, you're not helping your horse. And when he said it to me, and as soon as I did what he said I wasn't doing, it was instant. And the change was overnight and away I went. So it, it just goes to show at, at, at 18, you know, you, you are vulnerable to change and you can right decisions, wrong decisions in any way, be it your writing style or your job choice or whatnot. It's, it's you know, it's, 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 a, it's a delicate age for, for any young sports person. Because you mentioned that there was no issue over hurdles. The issue was only coming over fences then. Yeah, exactly. So, I, but I, I wasn't given the horse. When you talk about getting the horse on his hocks, you're taking a little bit of contact and you're just get him lift his head, make him concentrate, make him focus. I wasn't doing that. Mm. I didn't, because I've been out for three months and I came back with this approach after being on the sidelines, the old way was gone for me and okay. I couldn't relate back to it until it was said to me. Um, Monty's pass. Um your only Grand National winner. And I know by, after listening to the book, obviously means so much to your riding an entry Grand National winner, but it's funny because Tony McCoy tried for so long to get there. He got that one win. You got it earlier, more so in your career. 
and it just shows how difficult you can ride and every year it's only one chance every year it's kind of like the derby uh, frankly the Tory tried so hard before our tries came along it's um it's so difficult isn't it it's only it's one race once a year for the the big showpiece that you want to win and and that's it and you know in your career there's only 20 jockeys are there are 25 jockeys maybe that win it and so not everyone gets the chance mm. and some win it twice but it's it's probably the race of all because it's the one you grew up with as a kid you know sitting on the sitting room floor at the age of i think it was three or four watching grease paint that's my earliest life memory and um, so the grand national is is the race that stops the world if you like and um, and that's the one that you, you want to win more than any and yeah it'll be the biggest hole in your cv you know, Gold Cup, Champion Hurdle are brilliant races, but their second to the mm. Grand National is, yeah. is really the one. And Jimmy Mangan fancied his horse a long time out, didn't he? He did. He was second in the top one the year before, mm. over two mile six, and he ran well, but I suppose most importantly, he jumped really well. He was deadly run over the fences, and we knew the step up and trip was going to help him. So he'd also run in Cheltenham before he'd run in Aintree the previous year, and it might have just taken its toll. So Jimmy brought him fresh. He didn't go to Cheltenham, he went fresh to entry and he, he had a on song and he, he won, he was very impressive. There was a lot of money won as well from the lads that owned them as well, yeah. they'd been backing them all year long then. Mike Futter, um, Mike owned a lot of bingo halls, he was from Blackpool originally, um, so Mike had a, had a good few quid on him and mm. took a good few quid off him as well. And he had a difficult decision coming up to, you'll never walk alone who... Uh, you rode a Cheltenham Festival winner on then you had a tough decision then you know he was there to be rode as well so it wasn't just a case of he was your only your only ride Monty's Pass yeah um, you'll never walk alone wasn't likely to go for the race and I committed to ride Monty's Pass and then when he won in Cheltenham and between Cheltenham and Aintree it was decided maybe that he would go to the Grand National but I'd already committed to Monty's Pass and you know he'd been around there before so it was it, I know it was a big decision to make but um you know, I felt he was the horse to stick with and thankfully it, it worked out. Moscow Flyer, not only one of the greatest horses that has ever been in Irish racing, but the best probably one of the best you ever rode, but he 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 was more important than just those big days. He kinda got you starts, get giving you more bigger opportunities, didn't he? He did and yeah, he brought me to the top table really. Mm. I um my first grade one winner I rode on Alexander Brankwood in the Drillmore in Ferrius in 99, my local track, and I followed it up with the Royal Bond half an hour later on Moscow Flyer. But Moscow from there on, he was my flagship horse through my, I was 20 when I won my first grade one that day. Um, and to have Moscow right through to my mid 20s, Champion Chases, Tingle Creeks, Arkell Chase, you know, he was the Irish champion hurdles, everything. Moscow, he, he had a CV of, of his own. And um, no, he was an amazing horse to have and to have him for so long. Sprint to Sacra, of course, as well, a champion chase winner, an Arkle winner. They were two completely different horses, though, weren't they? Um, you mentioned in the book that Moscow Flyer was a big dosser. Um, he, he'd lose concentration very easy. Sprint to Sacra, completely different. He was a push button Ferrari sort of horse. You just go when you want to go. He was, yeah. So Moscow would lose concentration, he'd make mistakes, he was. You know, he was a bit of a flawed character, but he went four full seasons unbeaten, which was a testament to his ability. Mm. Um, Sprinter, on the other hand, though, was like a Ferrari, and he would just go anywhere, anytime, any speed. He would jump from outside the wings. He just, he had everything. You know, he was, he was unbelievable to ride. Um, but you could never say Sprinter, although visually he was the more impressive. But Moscow would beat an average horse by two lengths, and then he'd beat a Zertio and well chief by two lengths and both times he'd have an ear pricked so he, you would never know actually how much was in the locker because you never got to the bottom of Moscow until he was beaten and that, was, that took four years for something to beat him. Everybody looks forward to those big clashes on Saturdays watching at home watching racing um, whether it's in England or Ireland but those clashes between those horses that you mentioned Exertiop, well chief and Moscow Flyer they're unbelievable in Sandown and Cheltenham. Yeah, well, I suppose Sandham was the one in the Tingle Creek most of all because they all ran to form mm. and Moscow beat them, as I said, with one ear pricked. Whereas as Ertuk stepped into the water, jumped in Cheltenham and he disappointed. And in, that was in 2005 in the Champion Chase. Moscow absolutely doddled in that day, so there was yeah. there was no competition. But the Tingle Creek lived up to its billing, and you know it, it took a big performance, and Moscow delivered. Kicking King, huge. Uh, 
part, horse part of your career as well, um, owned by Connor Clarkson, trained by um, Tom Taff. Um, he won an Arkle, he won a Gold Cup, he won a King George. He gave you some massive days. Yeah, brilliant horse. Um, he uh, won his King George, his first one in 2004 in Kempton, and then he won the Gold Cup a few months later and back and the King George was ran in Sandown the following year. Yes. And he won there as well. And unfortunately he he had a good few injuries after that. He was a big okay. horse and I suppose he paid the price for as three mile chasers can do with yeah. their size and just the, the attrition rate with those, you know, they, they don't they don't maybe their careers get a bit cut short with injury, but um he was a very, very good horse. What's remembered with hit with him at Kempton and um, when he won the King George is uh, he could have very easily lost the race. He'd done so well to stay on him that day. I remember you see the picture where you wrap your arms around his neck, hugging him just to try and stay on at the last. Yeah, he went down to the last, and we we kicked on early as Ertu would run, and after Moscow beat as Ertu in the Tingle Creek in early December, he was as Ertu was tried over three miles in the King George, so we had to test his down and because we knew that was his the chink in his armor, so we went at it early and kicking King, and nearly paid the price because he was legless going to the last, and he just stepped into it and sprawled on landing and I hung on and he stayed on his feet and he, he got to the line as some lad ran across the track dressed as Santa Claus. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, I'm, there's no reason not to be honest uh, in a book because it's kind of, you're talking about what's happened and what's been and you've closed a book on your career, you've retired, but I, I thought you were very honest about certain things and very open. Um, Dundeer, I thought you were very honest about talking about what, what happened with that horse, Tony Martin's horse. Um, not riding my Cheltenham. Yeah, so I, I hadn't ridden the horse, but um, I was very pally with the lads who owned him, in particular Barry Callaghan, who was head of the syndicate. And uh, Paul Carberry had won the Tiestas and had won a few on him. So Paul If people was, remember, he was a reserve then, and a couple was. of horses came out for him to get in then. He had 9 10 as well. Yeah. Um, but if Paul was available to ride him in Cheltenham, Paul was going to ride him, but no one had a horse in the race, so I was banking on. on Dundera being one for me, but uh, mm. it transpired. Tony Martin wanted Ruby, and Tony got his way. So it was, it was one of those things. But it just shows the intensity of going into the festival. You know, you are looking to get on everything that you can with a chance because you know how hard it is to get winners. Yeah. So I had two winners that week, and as the week, as we got through the week and the week finished, Dundera wasn't as big of an issue. As it was at the start of the week because at the start of the week it was you know you were losing maybe what you thought was one of your best chance of a winner for the week so it was a tough one at the time but on reflection in the weeks later it it, it, it fizzled away to a, a lesser detail then and ruby who we mentioned there ruby a good friend you've been riding with him for so long but such a, a thorn in your side on on time on occasions as well but that's same in every sport at the at the highest level um, everybody, boxers, footballers, everybody has has their rivals, and Ruby's been a rival and a friend for so many years. Yes, yeah, so we would have come along really at the same time, um, and we would have competed against each other on all those good horses, Moscow, Zertiub, and you know Kicking King, and um, all the good horses he had over the years. So we would have we would have always clashed. So there was mm. there was always plenty of rivalry. Um, I was champion jockey twice. I was probably second to him three or four years as well um cheltenham festivals um i was champion rider there twice and i was second to him three years on countback so we the same with the winners but he beat me on second so you're kind of we, we, we've always been been clashing but we've always got on well we had a healthy rivalry and there was never any any dark side to it is he the best you've rode against i would say so yeah um you know i've ridden against brilliant riders um all the way through my career Paul was brilliant, Charlie Swan tactically was brilliant, Conor Dwyer, beautiful rider. Um, but I thought Ruby just, he, he ticked all the boxes. He was the hardest one to beat, I thought. Okay. Uh, Punjabi, he won a champion hurdle on him, but I suppose with the book, the biggest turning point for Punjabi was actually when you were third on him in the champion hurdle. Explain to people why that was. Yes, yeah, so at the time, Moscow had retired, Kicking King was finished as well, so... At the time, my, my, my cupboard was stripped bare of quality horses, and because I hadn't committed to Edward O'Grady or Tom Taff or Jesse, they were working with Robert Power with Jesse, and Tommy Ryan was with Tom Taff, and, 
and Andrew McNamara's led with O'Grady. So before I knew it, my piece of the pie was getting smaller and smaller. So I had a couple of lean years through 2007 and into eight, and um, Paddy Monaghan, who was a part owner of Catch Me with Edward O'Grady, um, Edward wanted me to try Catch Me in the Champion Hurdle because Andrew was riding Sizing Europe. So I presumed that was fine, Edward presumed it was fine, but Paddy Monaghan, one of the owners, who was a good friend and is still a good friend now, um, Paddy said, no, you're not lucky for me, so I didn't want me. So I got the spare ride on Punjabi, who was also a 25 to one shot, and he finished third. But Fitzy got injured, Mick Fitzgerald got injured badly in entry a month later, and um, I rode Punjabi in the Irish Champion Hurling Bunch set, and he won, and that left me in the, the box seat for the job as first jockey to make me and that lasted seven years he had unbelievable days and like we mentioned sprint to sacra already so many horses that that you simon sieg and but bob uh, bobsworth um three years in a row he won at the festival not many horses do that but um he was a little bit more special because you sold him to nicky henderson yeah so um it's something brother norman had him bought him as a yearly and uh, we kept him, we had him with the Land Rover sale as a three year old and he wasn't sold and we brought him to Doncaster as a four year old and Nicky bought him there for a syndicate and Bob's worked, uh, I suppose he was, a, he was a bit of a, you know, he was a very unassuming horse and his work at home would never lead you to believe he was the superstar he was but when you brought him to the race course he was a different animal and you know small, not the scopiest in the world but he was all heart and you know, he, won the, he won the Albert Barton, he won the RCA and he won the Gold Cup well so we, we had brilliant days he also came to Leopardstown and won the Lexus as well so he, he was a real uh, he was a superstar when he won the uh, Cheltenham Gold Cup um, you, you didn't really remember that as that wasn't as special as it probably should have been because of uh, what happened unfortunately with John Thomas McNamara the day previous to that then yeah JT had had his fall the day before um, and it was on the morning of the Gold Cup, the realization was coming through that you know how bad of an injury JT had, mm. had picked up, and um, the Gold Cup didn't matter because we no. knew what JT was facing and his wife Caroline and his kids, so it was immaterial and it put their, everything in perspective. And it was a brilliant race to win, but there was no joy in victory, and there never really has. But um, you know, unfortunately, JT has passed away since, um, but it, it was it was a hard time, but mostly of all for, for JT and Carla so it was, it was it was a tough time absolutely and like I mentioned earlier those seven years and seven barrows um, you moved on to then probably the biggest job in National Hunt Race and then being number one rider to JP McManus um, you enjoyed huge days for him and um, I suppose it kind of happened a little bit by you're obviously obviously going to be in the running for but Jetski and more of that were kind of the two big turning points I'd imagine the year previous to getting the job before AP retired um, by riding the second string. Yeah, so he, he picked um, he picked um, Binocular, I think it was, against Jeski. Or, yeah. or, sorry, no, my time to yours against My Jeske, time to yours. And he picked uh, Fisher's Cross over more of that mm -hmm. and I won the champion hurdle on Jeski and he finished second on my time to yours and I won the world hurdle on more of that and he finished third on Fisher's Cross. So. I suppose it did put me in a, in a mm. good position, but I'd ridden a lot of winners for JP over the years. As you said, You'll Never Walk Alone was my second festival winner, so yeah. I had a, a good connection with him over the years and shut the front door when the Irish Grand National AP was suspended, and that was a great great race to win. But um, yeah, so another one for JP. So I, I had great days before the job came along with him, and we enjoyed plenty more good days after. One of my f favorite two lines in the whole book, there's thousands upon thousands of words in the book, is the hen was involved, but the pig was committed. Yeah. JP McManus. Yeah. So he, uh, yeah, that's uh, for breakfast. The, the pig was fully committed anyway. So he's, uh, yeah, he'd often, he'd often put that one out, so he'd be given an impression of, of the commitment that, that that's good to show. And um, yeah, he, he, he was a brilliant man to work for. And it was a great opportunity. I, I've written a lot of winners for Nicky over the years, but everything was on the other side of the sea. So when I started writing for JP, it gave me the opportunity to write winners in, in Ireland, where things had gone very much loaded towards England. And on big Sundays in Leopardstown, I was sitting at home watching TV with no rain. Mm -hmm. um, so it gave me the opportunity. And it's what I longed for. And I got a massive kick out of winning 
and the, the Lexus and Bob's work with the Irish Grand National and shut the front door and, and when Sprinter Sacker came to punch them because it's 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 so important to, to win in your home turf. Mm. And it was after years and years you win Tingle Creeks, champion hurdles, everything, but to get to get success on home soil is what I longed for. So the job offered me that opportunity and I was very fortunate to get it and, and, and to ride lots of big winners. You had a lot of falls throughout your career, but after taking that job with JP, then you went through a very tough um, year, I suppose, that 2016, 17 season into that. You suffered a lot of injuries and a lot of sitting on the sofa watching someone else riding horses that you should have been riding. Yeah, I did. Um, I actually had a broken leg when I, when I took the job, so mm. that wasn't, I wasn't in great shape when I started. But uh, I broke both arms in, in the space of, I think it was nine months. and. Yeah, it, it, it just it comes like that. Um, probably fortunate enough that I missed, although I missed Aintree one year on Punchestown um, when I broke my arm at Fairless at Easter, but it was mostly the summer months I missed. So that, but if you're going to be on the sidelines, that's the easier time to be off. So luckily enough, I didn't miss too many of the winter months over the years. I missed one Cheltenham Festival um, when I broke my ribs and punctured my lung. So, and that was the only festival I missed throughout my career, which was, which was great. So... I suppose I had more time off during the summer, which made it that bit easier. That um, famous cup of tea at Punchestown, that was obviously a difficult um, thing to take when JP said that he wasn't going to have a number one rider. Um, it take, takes a lot um, for anybody to come back from that. He did give you every opportunity and told you what I found was interesting. He said, prove them wrong. Yeah, so there, there was certain trainers weren't happy with how I was riding and um, obviously they were making their, 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 their voices heard um, and there was a weight opinion against me. Um, so things hadn't gone brilliantly. We'd had a couple of winners in Cheltenham, but things hadn't gone that badly, but obviously some felt I wasn't riding as well as I should be. Um, so JP was no longer having a first rider, but he said to me, you know, prove them wrong. And, he gave me the opportunity and probably the first one was Bally Lachine in Killarney a month later and he ripped around Killarney and I think that was the, the start of turning the tide again so um, we had great success afterwards and it was it was a wobble along the way but now we, we enjoyed some great times especially this year's festival when I had all 11 rides were for JP and I had five winners on them so it was a good week. We'll get to that part in a second but just to uh, mention about JP a lot of people know those colours so well um, you, people don't get to hear from him too much on TV and everything else tell, little bit, uh, tell people a little bit about JP how he's obviously a very kind person very hard working, very successful um, tell us a little bit more about him yeah well he is all of those um, but yeah so I'm lying in hospital with, with I was in hospital in London for four days with my ribs and lungs and uh, JP sneaks in with chocolates for the nurses yes and actually and that's and, yeah socks and slippers and boxers and everything so people wouldn't be aware of what he would be thinking or doing mm. behind the scenes um i needed to get home from both the injury when i broke my leg um and that time getting back to my lungs so flying back with the lung punctured lung wasn't a great option so but he sent his chopper over and collected me in london and the same in liverpool with a broken leg when i wasn't even riding for him the leg wasn't stable i would the options a boat wasn't an option because it was going to be too rocky and I'd actually taken six seats on a flight to get home um, but I didn't need to worry because again JP offered the helicopter and it picked me up in Liverpool airport so no he's been a brilliant man he, he is so kind so generous and, but so wise and you would learn so much from working with him and you know he just sees he sees things that aren't obvious but when he says it all of a sudden they become screaming obvious to you yeah and we'll finish up on Cheltenham gone, like you mentioned, those five winners. Um, Cheltenham is in, Festival has been very good to you. Uh, 43 festival winners, only one man's rode more festival winners for me, and that's Ruby. Um, that was an incredible week for you. Did, did you know going into that week that this was going to be your last Cheltenham? Oh, I did, I did. Yeah. And even at uh, Christmas, I was riding the King George, and myself and Sam and Twiston Davis were at the start, and we're, we're kind of we're not barging for position, but we're, I had got the spot behind Sternan. And Sam was looking for it, and I said, "No, Sam, I want it. I want it." And and he was begging me. I said, "Sam, this could be my last one." So okay. I knew then, and I I decided in early December this was my last season. So I knew it going into Cheltenham. I knew I had good rides. I was hoping for success, but above all, I wanted to enjoy it. And you know, it was it was a, a an amazing week because it just the doors kept opening. 
and sometimes it happens like that and sometimes mm. it, more often than not it's the opposite that comes yeah. in your face so but they kept open that week and it was it was a brilliant way to finish off you know what has been a long career but enjoyable and i've loved it but uh, i love that week especially uh, to, to mention two of the horses of the five um epitant who won the champion hurdle to to bolt up again making it look so easy and then you take champ then two completely different ways of winning um, it was quite incredible the way Champ won, wasn't it? It was. Um, you know, his, he didn't jump as well as he can do, mm. um, but he got from A to B without being anywhere flamboyant or, or flashy. So he got there, and I knew I still had a chance during the second last, albeit I'm seven or eight lines down, but it's a long way home in Cheltenham. And when I saw Manila Window just fluff the last of it, I knew he was he was running on, on fumes, if you like. So... There was opportunity there and, and champ when i got stuck into him he really delivered i didn't share your confidence because i actually went down the shoot with a friend of mine and he backed manella indo and i backed champ and when we went back up to the up inside to watch it i actually crumpled up the docket and threw it on the ground but obviously i got down on my knees to pick it back up um it was an incredible finish and um, mentioning just those two horses before we go epitant will now be ridden by aiden coleman <laughs> Aiden, the way he rides kind of reminds me a little bit the way you ride. Would you, would you take that on board? Oh, Aiden's a lovely rider. I'm not looking for comfort when I say that, but no, Aiden's a lovely rider. Brilliant yeah. rider over a fence, brilliant rider over hurdles. Um, you know, he, he's won an epitant um, at the start of last season, the same day as the fight in the fifth when I was riding Groove Adair in Newcastle. So he knows epitant well, um, and he's ridden a lot of winners for JP over the years. So he's, he's you know, he's it was going to be Aiden or Nico I'd imagine and Aiden having won in our sure he was an obvious choice so um, but no he's a top class rider and you know his, his success he had at Cheltenham put the kettle on and again there only last week in the shoulder chase just yeah. shows you know he's a, he really is a top class rider and can Champ make that progression now on to be a gold cup winner I think he can he, he, he needs to tidy up his jumping mm. but he jumped well early on uh, in the season last year so I think if he gets his confidence back, there's no reason why he can't be. He has the ability, and it was it was his ability that, that won it for him, and um, won the RSA. You know he stays, yeah. but he, he has got class. So you know hopefully if, if if his jumping issues are ironed out, he'll he'll definitely be a player. How's retirement treating you? What are you doing with your time now, rather than dashing around riding work and going to the races? <laughs> I'm riding a small bit of work. I'm riding a bit of work for Gordon Elliot on it. Oh, he did mention the road Abercadaver actually a few I did, weeks ago. Yeah, before, before he got beaten. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now I've been riding some work for Garden, which is good. It's nice to ride good horses. Yeah. I always love that. Um, I've plenty of youngsters at home. Um, I just dropped two up to Warren Ewing there yesterday. So um, they're in the training three year olds for Pint of Anything, and uh, I have two year olds and three year olds and yearlings at home that I'm keeping my eye on. So I'm enjoying some family time as well. It's been a, a hectic career, and I've been a part time dad for the last twelve or fifteen years. So they're seeing a little bit more of me, which is great. Um, like I mentioned before, when I got here, is uh like most people i suppose their their wife are, is a huge part of their life but paula was brilliant the whole way along with advice um it came across very well in the book uh, she's not fed up of you yet anyway being here full time no <laughs> i'm sure there's days there that she is but no she's been a brilliant support all the way through yeah. and you know it's 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 easy being there on the good days but on the bad days yeah. you know it's it just to get that word and advice that you need at the right time it counts for a lot and she's been brilliant so no i owe paul an awful lot for 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 all my success good listen barry thanks very much for taking the time it's called true colors it's in all bookshops it's a fantastic present for people for christmas or of course you can do what i did and listen to it on um through amazon audible um so yeah congratulations on the book and well done over all those years all that success and uh, enjoy your retirement cheers Dave. thank you